And it was really, it was day one. Like it was sitting around a table, plotting, scheming, pulling out a huge annual calendar, coming up with ideas for campaigns and promotions and launch events, brainstorming headlines for ads, sending out some uh, invites to launch events, all of that sort of stuff. When I say sending out, I mean literally packing and sending and and folding envelopes and folding paper. And anyway, I was part of this startup and it took off. So in two years, we went from zero, absolute standing start, to about six million in revenue. Hello, this is Dr. Rowe and you're listening to the Growth Tribes podcast with Dr. Rowe and Harms. This is the podcast where two completely different generations tackle the most challenging topics that people are facing today. Above all else, the main reason that we chose to develop and record these podcasts is because we both have a passion for helping people go through life transformation, for improving their lives, for taking their lives to a completely different level. And it's our hope, our genuine, sincere hope that by the end of each of these episodes, you'll have gained at least one insight that you can take away and apply directly into your own life. Practical tools, voices that come in from both generations, the younger generation with tips and tools and the older generation with a sense of wisdom and experience so that you can help unlock your true potential to give the opportunity to make changes both on a personal, professional, financial and relationship level and to give you a chance to impact both your lives and the lives of other people around you. So we welcome you. Welcome to the Growth Tribes podcast. Hello, it's Harms here and welcome to another episode of the Growth Tribes podcast. And today, unlike other podcasts, I want to keep today's introduction very short because we are going through and have been going through a challenging time. We are all aware of that. We have all felt that in some way or another. But with challenge comes an opportunity to reset and reinvent. And specifically today, we're talking about resetting and reinventing in the world of business. If you have ever, so this is the important point to note right now this second, if you have ever, ever, ever wanted to start a business or reshape the current business you are operating in, now is the time. So to help us with this topic and this introduction, And to answer this question about resetting and reinventing your business during a challenging time or at any point in your lifetime, we have a special guest here to help you, the listener, with that topic of business right now. Before we get into the podcast, a short message. Now, if you love what we're doing here at the Growth Tribes podcast, we're in simple terms we are having a conversation. Now, that conversation I like to describe as the transference of generational knowledge. Now, I love that one. It's also been described as having a black belt conversation. Now, I'm blessed because I have that black belt conversation with Ro, and on occasion, we are super excited to introduce a guest into that black belt conversation like we have with us today. So you are in for a treat. Now, if you enjoy, if you love, if you learn, if you gain any insight from listening to the Growth Tribe's podcast, then I ask you to please become a Growth Tribe supporter to support the work that we do. And as a thank you for supporting the Growth Tribes podcast, you will get special exclusive Growth Tribe supporter perks depending on what supporter level you choose. It's that simple. It starts from literally one pound a month and you can support right now or straight away after this episode at growthtribes.com and that is growthtribes.com. I promised I'll keep the introduction short, and that is it for me, because we have a (laughs) hell of a lot to get into. So, Ro, over to you to introduce our guest today. Thanks, Harms, and thank you to all the listeners again for coming in and listening to today's program. I am super pumped. Uh, The gentleman I'm about to introduce, we've known each other for probably one and a half decades now, I'm thinking, and somebody I've got a huge amount of respect for. We don't necessarily touch bases as much as we used to, but I constantly keep him on my feed, look at what he's doing, because there's so many insights that Daniel brings to the table. You know, if you're listening to this and you're in business, you'd be foolish not to plug into all of the tools, the tips, the techniques, the books, the audios, his programs. So as we go through this, 
get your pens out. We're in for a real ride. I'm going to give you a formal introduction, as I always like to do, and then I'm going to just personalize it before I hand over to Daniel. But first of all, Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. And it's lovely to have an Aussie accent. Uh, my daughters are, have fallen in love with Australia, having dragged them over there a couple of times now, <laughs> and uh, not dragged, flown them over. Sadly, <laughs> they're not over there at the moment. So those of you, if you've not come across Daniel Priestley, we're going to make sure that you've got connections to him afterwards. There'll be a complete transcribe of the podcast as well. Um, I'm going to call him Dan because I've known him for a long time and, and he takes it either way. But Dan, Dan's a very successful entrepreneur. He's built and sold businesses in Australia, Singapore, UK. He's the co-founder of Dent Global, one of the world's top business accelerators for entrepreneurs and leaders to stand out and to scale up. So if you're even sitting on the fence thinking about or currently in business, you got to stay tuned into this. His offices stretch from London to Sydney, Singapore, Tampa, and the program that he has is endorsed by the Institute of Leadership and Management. Over 500 entrepreneurs and leaders each year participate globally in developing their businesses with the support of Daniel Dent and his high net worth mentors. And we are talking about some really switched on individuals here that he brings to the table. And, and knowing Daniel the way I do and knowing his values and his core ethics, the people that he does bring to the table will be totally aligned with that. He's an amazing author. He's inspired me actually over the years in the way he writes to keep that consistency in what I do. Best-selling author of books like The Key Person of Influence, Loved it when it came out. Remember when I used to be speaking around the country, often we'd cross paths or you'd have one of your trainings going on, Daniel, in the early days. I still remember that. Entrepreneur Revolution is another book you should get and make a note of. It will be in our notes today. Oversubscribed and 24 Assets. Go get these books if you're listening to this. Even if you're thinking about starting a business, get it. And if you're currently in business, you must. He's named one of the top 25 entrepreneurs in London by Swift and Williamson, Williamson Power 100 and awarded as being in the top 10 business advisors by Enterprise Nation. Now, that's the formal introduction. I'm going to add the Dr. Rowe spin on this. I personally believe that right now, globally, the world needs leaders with authenticity, with integrity, with a sense of purpose, but also with a natural intuition to read and understand the market. And there aren't that many out there who have all of those qualities. But, you know, I've known you for a long time, Dan, and he has all of those qualities. And myself and Harminder are very specific about who we bring to the table into this space, because over the years as a public speaker, and I've been all over the world doing this, one thing I found is there are people out there that talk about the subject and there's those that are actually passionate. They love it. They live it. They breathe it. And they are a proof of that. And that's Dan Priestley. He's a family man. He's got this gentle quietness about him, which is quite unassuming. And yet he's got an amazing impact in the way he delivers his message. I've shared the stage with him in charity space uh, as a speaker on the circuit, certainly back in the early days. And I've actually sat in and attended on some of his courses, which is partly how we met in the first place. And I've got a huge respect for him. So, Dan, that's a sincere message from me about you. What would be amazing is if you could sh let our listeners understand a bit about your background so they understand what I see in you as a person. Again, it's a huge honor and a privilege to have you with us today. That's one hell of an introduction. My goodness. I, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm on my toes already having to live up to uh, this this <laughs> This person who walks on water over here on entrepreneurial. Well, life. it was it was meant heartfelt. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I yeah, my my background is always very entrepreneurial. I discovered a book called The E Myth when I was fifteen years old, and yeah. um, I read it and I knew straight away that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I, and what he was describing was was this you know kind of you know that's what I'd been searching for. I read another book called Rich Dad Poor Dad when I was a teenager, and kind of I really loved the idea of becoming an entrepreneur and kind of being a bit of a rebel and a misfit and getting outside of the traditional career path and and sort of um, I was much more interested in creating jobs than than having one and yeah I, I throughout my teenage years I did a number of little entrepreneurial things like garage sales and nightclub parties and selling uh, yeah yeah I had, did some great nightclub parties actually um <laughs> Uh, if you well, if you're interested in that, the you know when I was about seventeen, eighteen, we launched a series of nightclub parties. 
we were getting a thousand kids at ten dollars a head uh, with all the costs uh, covered. So I was making like ten grand in a night in cash. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> it was really. And this cool. was in a nice climate, great weather. And yeah, great weather, beer. great climate, lovely people. Sponsored by McDonald's and the local council and the local radio station, and it was just it was a great time, really, really great time. What a what a fun way to start in business and we gave away skateboards and CDs and all that sort of stuff. So um, that was one of my first entrepreneurial proper ventures. When I was 19, I was super lucky. I, uh, I, I dropped out of university as I wasn't learning what I wanted to learn and I was feeling frustrated and I was working three jobs and I couldn't really, feel, I didn't feel like I was, you know, I was going the direction I wanted to. I was probably impatient as well, but I was so lucky. I fell straight into a entrepreneurial startup. So a, a guy who was, he was 38 years old, uh, which at the time felt like he was a proper grown up. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, starting a new company and he was a successful entrepreneur. When I went to his house, it was this beautiful waterfront mansion in Noosa. And he had three little kids and he had a humongous house. And he basically shared with me his business vision as to what he wanted to get started. And it was really, it was day one. Like it was sitting around a table, plotting, scheming, pulling out a huge annual calendar, coming up with ideas for campaigns and promotions and launch events, brainstorming headlines for ads, sending out some uh, invites to launch events, all of that sort of stuff. When I say sending out, I mean literally packing and sending and, and folding envelopes and yeah. folding paper. And anyway, I was part of this startup and it took off. So in two years, we went from zero, absolute standing start, to about $6 million in revenue and about 50 to 60 people in the office. We started around his kitchen table and we had big offices in Melbourne two years later. Wow. How old were you, Daniel, just so I know? Uh, uh, between 19 and 21. So we've got a young Dan Priestley and you're suddenly involved in that. Can I just add a question in there? What's going, for the younger listeners to this, what's going through your mind at that stage? I, I, I soaked it up. Like I was just, I would probably, if there was an opportunity to work on weekends, I'd work on weekends. If I could learn something from John, I'd just sit, sit and learn. If I could sit in on a meeting, I'd sit in on a meeting. If I could make sales, I'd make sales. It was actually what most people dream of in terms of a mentoring relationship. So yeah. basically, John really wasn't my boss. He was my mentor that I happened to work for. Mm. And and like every day was a lesson. And every day was, uh, he would he would take the time to explain to me why he was doing certain things and what he was doing. And and it was like a, a, a practical MBA, I guess you would call, you would think of it. Like mm. it was just daily lessons. And I also was a good student in the sense that, there were times where John needed to go to the airport and it was an hour and a half drive away to the to the closest airport and I would absolutely jump at the opportunity to drive him to the airport and back and pick him up from the airport at any time of day or night because it would give me 90 minutes to just have good conversations with him. Yeah. And uh, and that was, you know, that was great 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 times. So Daniel, question for myself, do you find the younger people around you now are pro that kind of activity and behavior because for myself i know i've done that in the past as well just to absorb what this wiser maybe more experienced person has but do you find that young people tend to do this now or they shy away from it or are they saying to you yeah if you pay me i'll drive you to the airport can i so just jump in very quickly and yeah. just add i think personally harms you are from my observation, slightly more of an exception because you you used to come and sit in the car with me when I'd go off to speak. But I've come across a lot because I met you in your 20s. I've come across a load of people that wouldn't have put that commitment in. So I think it's a great question. I'm interested to see what Dan's thoughts are at the moment. I've, I've experienced both. I've had people, you know, I, I employ well, over the years, I've employed hundreds of people and many of them are, are young people. And I've come across a number of people who have absolutely relished the opportunity to yeah. be part of that startup culture. Uh, right now on my team, I have a young guy on the team, Yusuf. Yusuf is absolutely dedicated to, if I, if I suggest a book, he's read it within a week. And he's come back to me with the summary notes. If I suggest a YouTube video, he should check out. He's he's on it. He he came to me with a business idea that he had that he thought one day I wouldn't mind doing this. I said, terrible idea. And he went, bang, I'll drop it. And he just completely dropped it. And then he said, what should I be doing? And I said, I think you should do this, 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 and this. And he said, okay, great. I won't worry about anything else. I'm just doing that. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I do have people on my team who have, who have really kind of jumped in two feet with the mentoring opportunity and i tell you i respond really well to it and he responds really well to it and if, mm. if you get the chemistry right between 
the the two people, it can be such a great rewarding relationship on both sides. So you're you're nineteen twenty six million, I think it was in a short space of time. What what happened next? Well, in year one, at the end of year one, I had an idea for the business. Um, the business was operating in Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne, and uh, it was doing about two million a year in each of those major cities. And I said to John uh, that I think that the regional areas would be very profitable because I'd analysed the amount of advertising spend that it cost to reach 100,000 people in the big cities and it was like a half to a third of the cost in the regional areas, places you've never heard of like Bendigo, Ballarat, Geelong, Can- you know, Cairns. You might have heard of some of these places. Yeah. But, but basically places that don't have more than 200,000 people living there. John said, well, you know, maybe we could try this. So what was interesting is from from year uh, from year one, at the, f- the first year, all I did was sales. I was on the phone making sales and I was on commission only, no base, just uh, 10% of everything that I sold. And then in year two, I, I got rid of a $12,000 a month commission stream that I was uh, earning to, in order to go back to zero to basically earn a, earn a, um, a percentage of starting an entrepreneurship, starting a business within a business. Hmm. And I absolutely nailed it. So uh, in year one, I did about $750,000 worth of sales in the regional areas. I picked three regional areas and we did uh, three $250,000 campaigns. And they were really profitable, 175 grand worth of profit out of 250. And what was interesting is is that the main city businesses that John had, they were making lots of revenue, but they weren't particularly profitable. Because he was growing so fast, he wasn't making a lot of profit. But I had made, I'd made over 175, well, 175 grand of profit. So what happened is that I walked to the car with him one evening after work and I said, John, I want to talk to you about something. I want to, I want to become a shareholder in the company. I've just built this 750 grand side of the business, 175,000 of profit. I've been from day one. Um, I want to be, I want to be a shareholder in the business. And for whatever reason, I timed the conversation wrong and he was having a bit of a bad day. He turned around and he said, Dan, if you want shares in a business, you go start your own business. And I think he was saying that almost to draw a line under the point of like, I'm not ready, but it's not how it landed for me. In my 22-year-old brain, 21-year-old brain, I went, oh, cool. I've got permission to go start my own business now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, so at 21, I quit and went and started my own business. And ah, brilliant. Basically, went and launched my own my own company, and essentially, kind of picked up where I left off with the internal business that I'd started with John. Yeah. And in my first year, I did one point three million of revenue, four hundred thousand of profit, and then that business in the next three years went up to ten point seven million of revenue. A great team, you know, really dynamic, fast growth business. Fantastic. You picked. Up, I'm going to pick up on a word. I know we've got other questions we want to cover, but you used the word luck. What's your view on that? Because when, when oh, an entrepreneur sense. uses the word luck, I know you have a different meaning to somebody else that just randomly throws the word luck out there. Yeah, so I, I really believe strongly in luck. I think um, you, you need luck on your side. You need lucky breaks. I was very lucky to meet John when I met John. I was really lucky to um, have certain things go in my favor. To do, have you, certain... do you believe you were putting yourself in that space to attract that to you? Because yeah, it sounds like of, you were. I kind of think of luck a, a little bit like wind that it's blowing somewhere and you need to kind of position yourself in the path of it. And there are lucky places and lucky people. Now, if I said to you, sitting at home watching Netflix series is less lucky than going out to a networking function with a bunch of millionaires, (laughs) then yeah, you could get your head around that that is as a concept is true. I can't tell you what will happen. Now, as it turns out, you might go out to a dinner party with some phenomenal, amazing people and nothing happens, like right. no connection, no chemistry, literally nothing happens. It was a waste of time. But I can, I can tell you that over time and distance, sit, the person who sits at home watching Netflix series and the person who goes out and meets interesting people is going to be luckier. Um, I can't tell you on what day lightning is going to strike, but I can yeah. tell you lightning's more likely to strike right. uh, in those environments than not. So there's lucky people and hanging around with lucky people is, is good. Uh, there's lucky places such as, you know, networks and, and, you know, places where kind of ideas come together. And there's certainly unlucky people and unlucky places. There's lucky behaviors, showing genuine interest in people, asking lots of questions, asking bigger questions rather than just the normal salutations, uh, you know, is obviously more lucky if you, if you deepen the questions that you ask with people and find out what's really going on for them. So all of these types of behaviors tend to be more lucky 
but but with that said, there's no guarantee and there's no there's no predictability to when luck will strike. But I do strongly believe in luck. Yeah. The other thing that I think about luck is that the the starting point, the absolute starting point, is you have to stop yourself in your tracks. And your jaw has to hit the floor with just how lucky you are to be alive at this particular moment in time. Beautiful. In particular, you know, the fact that you're sitting, Beautiful. you know, you've got technology around you. I mean, here's a crazy idea. There are literally cars circling the block on the off chance that I might need a ride. I oh, know. Right? <laughs> there, there are, you know, there are people developing world changing technology on the off chance that I might buy it. There are people fueling up airplanes on the on the tarmac on the off chance that I might want to fly somewhere. There are people loading information and content onto the internet on the off chance I might want to listen to it. I mean, we live in the most incredible lucky time. And if you can't start with the starting point of how lucky you already are, and realistically, anyone listening to this podcast, and I know it's a pretty brash thing to say, but you are so much luckier than 90% of the people alive today and 99% of the people ever who have ever lived. So like the starting point in my life is that mm. I'm just so damn lucky. I'm That's beautiful. Lucky. Yeah. And you know what? What One of the things that we do here on this podcast, we just dig, we, we dive deep. We, we call it go to black belt, forget white belt and green belt. We just go straight to black belt. That philosophy alone is, is profound. And I really appreciate you bringing that to the table because that I think has, when I watch you and see what your journey that's guided you, you've constantly put yourself in the place. I remember watching Daniel having intensive conversations occasionally at an event and, you know, you could see it was, a, it was a deep conversation and in each one of those, the dots start to join together and it might be another two months before that conversation manifests itself, but you're creating it by the fact that you're putting yourself in that path as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. So what then sort of led you on that journey over to the UK to, to this place where we are with Dent now? Yeah, so the, basically um, in 2005, I was growing the business very rapidly and we went up to about 10 million and there was an opportunity to exit the business to the company that we're in partnership with. And it had also run a kind of natural end that that journey for me had, I was, I was done, I was over it, um, I was exhausted. And actually there was a natural point of break as mm. in like I can take a break and I don't have to worry about much. So because from 19 to 25, I had just done nothing but work really like when I say nothing but work, I mean, probably one weekend off a month, uh, a month for years. Mm -hmm. And um, because we used to do a lot on weekends with the business. So it was just pretty much most weekends. It was something, something to actually do. So when I say I worked weekends, I mean, I worked weekends in terms of on site at an event at right. seven in the morning and leaving the event with clients at 10, 11 o'clock at night mm. um, on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> like it yeah. was, it was relentless. Um, in the year that we did over 10 million in sales, I did 174 events in 12 months. Whoa. Um, wow. An that average of 300, yeah, 100, 300 people per event, 200,000 a month in marketing costs. Like it was, uh, it was just a, a really full on year. So I spoke to a mentor of mine and he said to me, um, why don't you travel and why don't you do this thing in the UK for a couple of years where there's this top speaker, you can go and launch them in the UK and kind of have a little sideline business and do maybe one or two campaigns a year, which to me would be a massive reduction in activity. I thought, yeah, that sounds cool. No sooner did I get to the UK, I realized that this could be a really cool opportunity I threw myself into it and we, we, we launched the business in September and by December we'd done the first 800,000 worth mm. of sales, pounds, and then in the first... Which is, which is about when we met, I think, actually, from memory. Yeah, 2006. Yeah. yeah. So it was just basically I, I'd never been above the equator. I'd never been to London. I was quite shocked at how low London was, like no high-rise buildings that I was expecting to see. And kind of weirdly in my head thought London might look a bit like New York but <laughs> I mean it's really weird right that's how naive I was and I I I'd literally moved to London to start a business not even knowing what the city looked like and um yeah we did two million pounds in the first year and then four million the year after that so it was another fast growth business yeah and then you know fast forwarding now I mean it's not been a smooth journey there's been ups and downs but what's kind of led you to this point now 
So in 2008-9, there was the global financial crisis. Um, yeah. My business comprised of two main speakers who were international speakers, and we would do about £2 million worth of revenue off each um, in London. And um, in the global financial crisis, I lost both of them. So uh, one of them from the US, the US dollar collapsed, uh, the pound collapsed against the dollar, and it was no longer feasible to bring him to the UK. And, and also people were less interested in personal and leadership development. So it wasn't, it just wasn't going to work. And um, so that was two million pounds worth of business gone. And then the other guy uh, basically focused on his Asian business and went back and he had resort a resort in Asia that he wanted to base himself out of and, and not travel so much. Mm. And suddenly I went from having a uh, four million pound a year business to collecting about 400 grand worth of outstanding collections, but uh, essentially having no business um, mm. all overnight, having about 15 staff to get rid of and uh, just a just a horrendous kind of reset. You know, weirdly too, I had this attitude of like, oh, I'll just keep sailing out into the storm even though everything's going wrong. I'll just keep pretending it's not. So I kind of shot myself in both feet in that time and I plowed through so much capital and it was just a very strange, complete reset of uh, of the business. But it was during that time that I had to get real with myself at a low point and say, well, what do I actually know about? What is my passion? What do I want to what, what do I want the next 10 years to be about? What lessons have I learned from all of this? Essentially, I wrote the book called Key Person of Influence, which was about my time mm -hmm. uh, working with famous speakers and what they do differently and how they do what they do and how they get paid 10 grand to talk and all that sort of stuff. And then um, I wrote the book. I launched the Key Person of Influence Accelerator. I was very into accelerators at the time and, and learning from that business model, like Y Combinator and, and those kind of businesses. And then, yeah, 2010, we relaunched. And over the last decade, we've gone and built a, a global business. We now run, we've got a, our major offices in Toronto, S Sydney, and London covering the three major time zones you know there's there's about there's also uh, another three companies in the group that do film production it develop uh, it technology projects book publishing and then on top of that we've i've just started a brand new startup as a data marketing business uh, collecting data and utilizing it kind of a little bit without being horrible a little bit like cambridge analytica but for small businesses yeah okay like helping small businesses to adopt nice. a hyper-targeted marketing approach. Yeah. And we've just raised a good 300,000 pounds for that business. And we're just putting, you know, putting, we're actually putting on about 30 clients a month at the moment. So it's fast growth. It's, it's taking fast. off. Yeah. Um, and uh, you've, you've got married, you've grown a great I've married, beard. I've got three <laughs> kids, I've written four books. I, I'm not, not watching a lot of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the that's one of the biggest messages that I'm taking away from that. <laughs> what from Daniel's in introduction is, you know, you've got to get to work and you've got to put yourself in the position of luck, off the foundation, the fact that we we are lucky. Period. So, Ro, if okay with you, can I move on to yeah, yeah, the next fire. question? That's great, so, great summary, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. So, sure. what what's interesting is, you know, you use the word change or you've actually been through a hell of a lot of change especially when it came to the financial crisis plus moving country starting a business again from scratch multiple times so based on what's happening right now when the world around us is changing what i find fascinating is the way lots of people react to that particular change and for listeners listening the change at the moment is coronavirus covid19 Daniel previously just spoke to us about the financial crisis there briefly in his, in, in his uh, introduction. But many people, what we're noticing is many people are driven either by fear and scarcity, which is, you know, natural, it's a typical natural reaction for us. And I do understand that to any kind of significant change. But we all react differently based on our own personal development and perception of change. So one of the questions I had for you to start this off is, as someone who has lived through one many global changes and successfully built businesses, but plus, you know, tough times, change of complete environment and circumstance, it will be really good to for the listeners at home and for myself to get an understanding. What was your initial reaction when coronavirus hit, COVID nineteen hit, based on the fact that you employ lots of people, you've you've got this business operating, multiple businesses operating. What was your initial reaction? Because I'm really curious to know, is it different to how the general public or normal people, as we say, are reacting? 
Um, yeah, my reaction was a little bit different. I kind of went, oh, finally, finally. Uh, <laughs> so what was – my first business was started off the back of uh, September 11. Um, and the the recession that followed September 11. And then the next business, Dent, was started off the back of 2008, 2009. And then from about, I don't know, 2013 onwards, there was like eight years of just economic growth nonstop. And it was just everything was overheated. And and I, I was just getting ready for the next thing. Like I knew there was going to be, I didn't know what was going to cause it, but you know, six months before coronavirus came, I released a report to my clients called the crash report. I basically said, we're due for a crash. We're due for a massive disruption. Every 10 years, there's a huge disruption and we're well overdue for it. The inverted yield curve has has happened a while back. It, it's just the fundamentals just for me don't feel right. And you can't just keep growing to the moon uh, the way that we are. Mm. Something big's coming. And I basically said there's four or five things I want you to do. So um, C was for building a cash buffer and R for was, God, I don't even remember what R was for, but um, A was for assets and automation. And yeah. then uh, anyway, I basically outlined it all in this crash report. I came up with an acronym for, well, uh, R was for uh, rationalize expenses. Mm. Uh, so I basically came up with a Sensible. model. I said, look, here's the here's the things I want you to do in preparation for the whole market going down. And I've, I started saying to people, it's going to be big. It's going to be a big crash. Something big is going to come along. There'll be a trigger. I don't know what the trigger is going to be, but there's going to be a big thing that happens and, and the whole market's going to go tits up. And then everything will, you know, there'll be mass unemployment and there'll be, you know, all of the things that you would expect to see. So I, I actually released the report and said it's probably going to happen in 2020 in a big way. So a year before that, I'd also said that 2020 will, will be a massively turbulent, turbulent year because the baby boomers en masse are turning 70 and retiring. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and I said, you know, at 2020, there's a real tipping point in the same way that 1963 was a tipping point for people turning 15, 16 and buying music and the Beatles boomed um, with a song called I Want to Hold Your Hand. You know, you can predict if there's a lot of people in an economy at the same age at the same time, you can predict what they're going to be doing and how it's going to unfold. And I kind of just said, well, look, the baby boomers in the year 2020 are yeah. like well and truly over 70 and they're yeah. going to be doing all the retirement things. So when it happened, I went, okay, cool. Like I've been expecting this. And I had a whole, a whole action plan as to what we do and how we respond. And we just started playing, playing out that action plan. That's amazing. That's fascinating. And my takeaway from there is <sighs> you were looking ahead. Yeah. Is that fair to say, Daniel, on a constant basis, you're just looking ahead, thinking about the future, how you can protect the business, your people within the business, rather than just cracking on with a daily thing. And then all of a sudden you hit a brick wall. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. The first, the first time I got caught off guard was the, because I started my first company off the back of 9-11, but I wasn't in business during 9-11 and the dot-com yeah. crash. So it was kind of like I was just, I, I didn't know what it was like to go through that. I just knew what it was like to get started during that time. And I wasn't particularly paying any attention to it. I didn't, I didn't, at that particular time, I had no idea that an event in New York would have any impact whatsoever on me living in Australia. So I thought it was newsworthy, but didn't see that it had any influence whatsoever on on the business community in Australia. So so it was just outside of my awareness, and I just cracked on and kind of naively. It, it wasn't even stressful because it wasn't even in my mind. I then got caught massively off guard at the speed of how fast things changed, um, and the speed that it all came crashing down in two thousand and eight, two thousand nine, um, and how long it lasted, and all of that sort of stuff. And I just thought to myself, well, I'm not going to get caught out like that again. You know, I'm going to make sure that uh, next time that happens, I'll be ready for that. So, kind of, you know, just just had that in the back of my mind and had a plan and and had a uh, when the market when the market tips over, here's here's what we're going to do. I think the word preparation jumps out there, um, and it kind of leads me into. I'm going to follow on what you're talking about, Harms, as well, because I remember back in the mid '90s. Uh, so I would have been in my 20s, my mid 20s. I'd finished my PhD. I'd embarked on an engineering career, although 
I'd already looked at businesses and played with a couple of startups myself. And the thing I was being told by people, because we went into a, a period of unrest and recession during that period, early, it's early to mid 90s. And people were like, oh, don't go and start a business. Stay safe in your job, bro. You've got a PhD. You know, you just need to get your head down, follow your career. But I was, you know, I was reading books uh, uh, all over the place, similar to what you were talking about. I was just like a sponge, uh, even following people like Les Brown, reading all the classic historical books like Think and Grow Rich, because there was something in my soul that told me I want more than this career. But the, the people around me in their jobs kept saying, oh, it's a recession. You shouldn't start up. And history just keeps leading us back to this cyclical effect of we are going to have down periods and up periods. So I guess I've got kind of a two part question just following on from what Harms asked. The first part would be, I think you've answered it, but maybe worth elaborating on it. In your view, is now a good time to be an entrepreneur, bearing in mind where we're at? And secondly, how you use the word disruption. So I'm going to throw in a second question. How should entrepreneurs handle disruption? So two parts to the question. Cool. So the first one is, uh, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. The the reason I say that is there's never been so much money in the economy. In the mm. UK, we've just had 133 billion pumped billion, into yeah. the economy. And also liquidity. You know, every small business out there has just got a 50 grand loan and, um, you know, people are getting grants and, you know, there's a lot of liquidity in the economy. And, uh, and people are looking to change. They're looking to, they're not business as usual. They want to do stuff. They want to actually put themselves in a good position. And also a lot of business owners are retiring. So there's huge gaps in the marketplace forming. And when recessions happen, the biggest companies in the economy, they retract their core business. They go back to what they do best and they drop everything else. And often to their own demise. So Kodak uh, decided to focus on photographic film and paper in 2002 and drop digital cameras and would have been the, the world leader in digital cameras had they right. had they pursued it. Blockbuster Video decided to pursue and focus on its retail stores and dropped uh, subscriptions and downloads and mail order. You know, even, even Facebook in 2009 decided to stop focusing on mobile first and start focusing on desktop and advertising platforms. Mm and had to go and buy Instagram for a billion because basically Instagram came along and did mobile first. And had, had Facebook not been disrupted, they would have absolutely done a light version for the mobile. Right. Um, so, Oh, by the way, can you, for our listeners, define in, your, in, in Daniel Priestley's mind what disruption means? Because everybody's got a slightly different perception of that. Essentially, every, 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 if you think about it like this, every 10 years you're going to have a major personal disruption in your own personal life. And every 10 years, you're going to have a major economic disruption, at least. So you're going to get majorly disrupted every five years mm. um, on average. So a personal disruption could be that you have someone in the family who's ill, maybe a new baby joins the family, you might um, have a, an illness or a sickness, you might have a bout of depression, you might have bankruptcy, you know, uh, you might lose a major client or a job. Um, all of that stuff is personal disruption. It's basically things just seriously don't go to plan. Or you know things seriously, you know you, you, you yeah you, you're you lose a major income stream, you lose something you kind of take for granted, your health, your a family member, a friend, and something suddenly catches you off guard. And then a, a major disruption, economic disruption, is that that happens for everyone. So mm. you know there's a shock in the economy. Yeah. Um, and historically, I think over the last 92 years, we've had nine major disruptions. So almost like 10 years, like clockwork. If I was yes. a conspiracy theorist, I would say yeah, that yeah. it's built into the system or something, right? <laughs> but, but, but like almost 10 years, like clockwork, you, you talked about early 90s, you know, so right. they, they just keep coming in and, and disrupting. And there's another, there's another kind of form of disruption too, which is that normally after a global shock, we enter a new phase. So in the 90s, we entered the PC era, and then in the 2000s, we entered the internet era. Mm. Uh, in the 2010s, the mobile internet era, and yeah. now we're going into the AI 5G era. And every 10 years, a fundamental, massive new piece of technology comes along that really seriously changes what's possible for entrepreneurs and for business and the way that we live and work. And this one that's coming is a big one, a, a really big one. This is on an order of magnitude compared to what we've ever seen before. This is, if, if we were at a different period of time, this would be like a bunch of people out in a field pl plowing a field by hand, 
looking across and seeing a tractor for the first time. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> that's a that great. That's a great uh, example. What we might do is actually tie back to that question a bit later because I want to shift gears slightly and talk about business itself because we've got you on Daniel and this is already turning into a business masterclass and just to give you a bit of context interestingly enough when I talk to other young business owners entrepreneurs about business the conversations we have or the people I have the conversations with can almost fall into two categories it's either a young person who's fired up about business but has no idea where to start. So this this podcast and listening to you is a great starting point for them. And a younger person who is actually just terrified about starting a business, but they really, really want to. So again, the podcast is a good starting point for them. But here's the really cool part. Almost within every one of those conversations, there will be reference to your books. So this is why I'm extra excited to have you on today. So key person of influence, right. entrepreneur revolution, oversubscribed, uh, oversubscribe is one of the first audiobooks I listened to, and I was like, "What a great tactic!" That <laughs> uh, twenty four assets. So, really, what I'm saying, Daniel, is you are well placed to answer this next question about business as a whole. And the question is, what is for those young people listening, or even somebody who's you know maybe they're older and they just had enough of their job and they want to sh- make a shift. What's important when starting a business? So just take can I to that add to that because it's a cracking question. Please. Bear in mind that we've got listeners, Dan, who are sort of 50, 60, who maybe don't have that same level of enthusiasm. You're just talking about harms, a bit tired. They've been screwed over their, their career. And this whole experience with COVID's made them go, maybe I'm not valued, but I've got all this experience. What can I do? So if you can talk to those uh, peripherals as well, that'd be useful. Yeah, great. So um, if we were talking about sport, uh, there's a huge amount of urgency to get into the right sport at 15 and then make the absolute most of your 20s and then go into like winding down mode between 20 and 30, uh, between 30 and 35, right? And then you kind of become a commentator at 35 and and maybe go on the BBC and talk about sport. So if 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 you're in the sporting world, things you know your decade of achievement is probably your 20s and you know after that you've got to scratch your head and say well what do i do now Hmm. now it's a bit different with entrepreneurship so uh, we all hear about mark zuckerberg at age 21 22 and we hear my story of age 21 22 and we hear about uh, bill gates you know 21 22 and you would be forgiven for thinking that it was like sport and that it was like that you had to get really your shit together in your 20s or else you're in trouble right um but it's absolutely not like that. So, so statistically, the uh, fastest growing companies on average are started by 42-year-olds. And statistically, the big exit happens for a 57-year-old. A multi-million pound exit happens at 57. So if you imagine that the statistical average is that someone's had a career, 15 years experience, maybe mm-hmm. more, and then they start a business in their early 40s, they grow it for 15 years and then they sell it for millions. That is, if you were to go down to Coots Wealth Management um, Bank uh, down on the Strand and you were to talk to a wealth manager who comes across hundreds of millionaires all the time and you would say, give me the typical entrepreneur who's got you know 10 million in the bank, um, they would say, well, this particular person started their company at 42 and they built it for 15 years and then they sold it for 35 million and they had three or four shareholders and they each walked away with between five and 15 million each. Mm, very interesting. Um, you know, and that's actually the non-newsworthy event. So if a plane if a plane takes off and, and wobbles a little bit and has to re-land, that makes world news. And every day, four million people fly in a plane perfectly safely and it doesn't make the news at all. So remember that the newsworthy event is the statistically irrelevant event. Um, anything that is statistically rare makes the news and anything that's statistically normal doesn't make the news. So the the mainstream media or any media does not care at all about a 57-year-old who sold the company for 35 million. That that is not even newsworthy. No one cares. No one's going to no one's going to stop the press for that story. Yeah. Um you know, in news today, a you know, a man who started a company 15 <laughs> years ago built it up and and sold it for a lot of money to another company. It's like that that's just not going to 
uh, make the news. And, and then yet, and yet, and yet, you know, two minutes before, there's a big thing about that uh, somebody's won the lottery. That that attracts more attention. It, it, totally right. Statistically rare. So <laughs> so the whole the whole thing is that is that um, you've got time if you're young. You've got plenty of time. So one of the things is there's no rush to be out there starting a business. It's not a bad thing to start a business if you want to get some experience and if you kind of know what it is. I feel like you shouldn't probably start a business. You should know what business you want to start and and be mm. be begrudgingly sitting there going, okay, you know what? The world needs this business to do this thing and no one else is doing it, so I better do it. Yeah, that's and well worded. Good. Great sentence. I love that. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, do it reluctantly. But look, if you're in your 20s, the number one thing that I would highly recommend is that in the UK, there are 40,000 fast growth businesses that grow by 20% year on year. Out of 5.7 million businesses, most businesses are not growing very much. Most businesses, you know, a huge number of businesses are taxis and huge number of businesses are fish and chip shops and consultants and all that sort of stuff. But there are 40,000, 40,000 businesses wow. that are fast growth businesses. They grow 20% year on year. Typically, they've got teams of five to 50 people. And when you join a team of five to 50 people, you've got visibility. You can see what's going on around you. You can see what the salespeople are doing. You can see what the marketing people are doing. You can see what the finance and the management and the operations people are up to. And looking around that business, you're, you're going to start to see how a business actually fits together. If you go and work for a company with more than 50 people, you lose that visibility. You'll find yourself in a sales team completely unaware of what the other teams are up to and what they're doing mm -hmm. and what... You won't be invited into any management or leadership meetings whatsoever. So you'll lose visibility as you as you cross over 40 or 50 people. Would it be fair to say as well, within that smaller group size, there's more accountability? People have a, more, a greater sense yeah, of responsibility. Yeah, you, you can't hide. You yeah. know, so, and you, you get given responsibilities that normally wouldn't, wouldn't be thrown onto you. So uh, for anyone in their 20s, your job is not to start a startup. Your job is to join a startup. Your job is to be employee number five. Your job is to... Find an entrepreneur who inspires you, and if you if you can, and I know it's a middle class thing to say, but if you can, basically say, I don't care what you pay me, I want to join this startup. Mm. I want to. I'll sweep the floor. I'll um. I'll you know. I'll drive you to the airport. Whatever it yeah, takes. Yeah. I love this startup, and I want to be part of it. If you need me to sit on the phones making phone calls, fine. Right. I just want to be part of this um, startup. Now, if you can get yourself in on a fast growth company, that is half the battle to later on down the track having a fast growth company. You would you would be utterly shocked how predictable it is that the millionaires and you know the people who are predictably millionaires um, down the track, they almost all worked for someone who did something incredibly similar, and they were kind of like under somebody's wing for five years, and then mm -hmm. they went off and did it themselves. Yeah. And when you think about it like that, it just makes so much sense. But it's not sexy to hear it that way. Well, it's no, sex sexier to to just be nineteen, come across a fantastic, cool new invention, start it from scratch. That sounds sexy. So I guess that's what people are pursuing. When the statistics show you've got way more chance of success if you follow the model that Daniel just explained to that you. That almost never happens. The idea yeah. that I mean, when it does happen, by the way, when it does happen, it is often a young person. So it is actually often a young person who's tinkering with social networking when no one else is. And it's, you know, a lot of those brand new technologies, there's no business model, there's no revenue model. So it's typically that kind of person in the dorm room tinkering right. away with it who's not worried about it making money. They just love doing it because they like it. Mm. And, you know, they're, they're tinkering with a drone and trying to attach a camera to it and, you know, they blow up 17 of them and then they figure out how to do it. And, <laughs> you know, that that does happen. So when it, when you hear about someone who comes up with something game-changing, it is often a young person, someone who's yeah. got a bit of time on their hands and isn't particularly under pressure to make money today. But when you hear about the predictable businesses, the ones that, the ones that like, the, the when I think about the predictable millionaire, it's the guy in his 50s who owns seven or eight properties, owns a portfolio of investments. The business spits out, you know, 250, 350, 400 of, of profit a year. That gets reinvested into different places. The business pays for a great lifestyle and investments. And over time and distance, it's, it's doing well. It's running well. It's running quarter on quarter growth. It's got a good dynamic team and a good quality product and a nice niche. And then ultimately at some point, 
someone comes along and says, I'll have that. Thank you very much. And then there's a two to, you know, two to three year exit plan uh, to hand the business over and to, and to capitalize on a bunch of, you know, bunch of money. And then, you know, they're onto the next thing, but that's, that's your kind of, you know, and the business is normally like 15, 20 years old. So, you know, that's your statistically relevant millionaire. You know, one of the first millionaires I hung out with was a friend of mine's dad who mum and dad uh, who built a pest control business on the Sunshine Coast and sold it for four million? And basically, I, I witnessed firsthand because I went through school with this guy, and I, I actually dated the, the, their daughter. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Is that a strategy we can share on the podcast today? Yeah, that's a great, <laughs> a real great strategy, actually. You, you know, although you you have to play your cards right because you're not naturally the best friend of the dad at that point. <laughs> uh, but, but basically, they ran a pest control business. They ended up with about twenty trucks on the road. They they focused on a very unsexy industry: pest control, termite control, putting down pest control barriers into homes. And they had you know twenty trucks on the road. And they sold that business for four million dollars. And mm. uh, along the way, they had bought seven, eight, nine houses, and they uh, pa- they sold the business and bought their dream home and paid cash for it. And it was, you know, and and they retired fifty five, fifty six years old. You know, I witnessed how unsexy it can be, <laughs> like how how really, literally, you know, a a boring business that picks up the phone and talks to builders and construction companies and gets their pest control contracts. You know, given 15 to 20 years, that makes millions. Yeah. Uh, and this is great because we're, we're, we're talking about so many different ways to walk into this. And for the ones that are, if you like, your plodders, you just keep hitting and hitting and hitting. You can hear a, a very clear description from Daniel here about it doesn't have to be this wow, shiny business suddenly blows up and creates a huge amount. It's a steady, steady flow, which kind of leads me to another question. And it's one that I've been through myself. I want to do, I'll probably do it as a double barrel question, actually following on from you, Harms. And that is certainly for me over the years, and I've noticed this in many people that I've either coached, worked with, or been in front of in the audience, is there is definitely a transitional period or point where you go from, I've started my business to now, oh gosh, this is growing and it's more than just me. And I think for many people, there is a block associated with taking the business to another level. And that block has many assets. And uh, this one I'll kind of pick your brains on. For me, certainly it was, I remember the first time I, I took on somebody for the first time. And now it's not just Rohan, it's actually Rohan and somebody else I've just engaged. Then there was another person and the shift in responsibility. Mm. What do I let go suddenly, of? Suddenly, suddenly you got 10, 15 grand a month worth of payroll. Yeah, right. And, and it, it, it is a block. So two part question. Number one, what about, you talked in millions, so let's talk about that. So what about scaling up now from a startup? What about scaling up to your first million? And then, and you talked about this, I think just before the interview, I think you've been out to the London School of Business and that was one of the questions. But part two is what changes beyond a million when a business grows, say, to 10 million? Cool. Um, I also just want to circle back on that that one question you said for the person who's sort of 45, 50, should I start a business and all that? Sort yeah, of yeah, stuff. yeah. Okay, thank and you. The, and the quick, the quick answer to that is that you're standing on a mountain of value. And when you climb a mountain and you stand right at the top of a mountain and you're literally standing on the summit of a massive mountain, you can see the horizon really clearly and you can see yeah. everything around you. But the one thing you cannot see is the mountain. You're actually too close to it. Very true. And when you've been through 15, 20 years of experience in an industry and you're surrounded by other people who have been through 15, 20, 30 years of experience and when you're, you know, when your normal month is like doing a project that, you know, is great and it's transformational but that's just a normal month and, and you know, when you kind of have people who you know who, you know, sit on boards and those kind of things, it becomes very blasé and you think to mm. yourself, oh, okay, well, I'm not special and I'm not sure what to do and this I'm not normal. And the truth is, you're, the, the chances are you're standing on a mountain of value and you've just, be, you've just got what's called proximity bias. And the funnest example of proximity bias that I love is my father-in-law. So my father-in-law wears a, a 1969 Rolex. He bought it for £350 in 1969 and he's worn it every day since. And um, he wears it mowing the lawn. He wears it when he, you know, when he's um, in the tool shed. He he wears it pretty much all the time. I don't think he really takes it off, and he hasn't done since 1969. Um, and I looked it up online, and it turns out that it's worth about eighteen thousand pounds. It's mm. a vintage collectible Submariner that that has a investment value. 
And I kind of say to him, if you had bought that watch for 18,000 pounds, would you wear it mowing the lawn? (laughs) Like, and I've said to him on several occasions, would, you know, I've said, I've said to him, you know, why don't you sell it for 18,000 and buy yourself a brand new Rolex for 5,000, mm. you know, mountain, like, mountain. yeah, yeah. And, and it's this it. proximity bias to him. It's his old watch. Uh, and even though it's worth 18,000 pounds, he can't see it as anything other than 350 pounds. So the funny thing is, is that when I talk to a lot of people who are, you know, 45, 55, 65, they're sitting there with their, literally their collectible vintage, you know, priceless watch, metaphorically speaking, saying, oh, this old thing, you know, oh, I know, you know, I don't think of it as very valuable. And it's like, well, it's really valuable. Stop, (laughs) you know, you're in a hip, you're hypnotized into a state of um, apathy about the value that you have. Hmm. And it's I mean, right there. It's not far away. You don't have to learn coding. You don't have to learn some brand new skill. You're literally sitting there with a priceless artifact, yeah. um, which could be a story. It could be knowledge. It could be a you know your networks. It could be all of those sorts of things. But you just take it for granted. That's a great way of describing. I mean, just just to bring a spin from Deepak Chopra for those of you listening, you know, one of the phrases he used years ago, and I've held on to it, is "be a silent witness in the moment." And you know, if you're at a stage of transition and listening to what Daniel's saying is be a silent witness to yourself, step back, float up from the mountain and look down and realize just how much you've got under your belt and how much value you have out in the industry. Yeah. Stop looking at the horizon Yeah, and, and look at, look at the mountain you're on. Let's talk real, real kind of fast, uh, roll up the sleeves, fast and dirty street fighting. How do you get to the first million? The first million is pretty easy if you're associated with someone who's somewhat semi-famous or somewhat well-known. Anyone who's got more than 10,000 genuine followers on Instagram or Twitter or you know, someone who's maybe got more than 20,000 followers, something like that. They've written a best-selling book. If, they've, if, they're, if they're in their industry and they're reasonably well-known and they've got that they've got their story down pat and all of that sort of stuff. It's very easy to make money around those people. So like, for example, if I had to start from scratch, I would probably buy any commoditized business and then stick a famous profile associated with it and start running weekly and quarterly campaigns around that. So the first million, and mind you, I have bought businesses like this. I've bought, I've bought, I bought a digital agency that was doing 350 grand with 10 people and then two years later, three years later, we're doing a million with 10 people. Mm. Um, why? Because I get out there and talk about them. And, you know, I've, I've got the books and all that sort of stuff. And I've done the same with, with some other businesses. But essentially, a, weekly, a mini weekly campaign, a decent quarterly campaign, and an annual big message combined with someone who's semi-well-known. It doesn't have to be stopped in the street well-known. It doesn't have to be you know, a dragon from Dragon's Den or something like that. But but it does have to be someone who's who can pretty much open doors and who people would show up to see them speak or something like that. Right. Um, and that's been the easiest formula that I've used again and again and again and again to do the first million. And I've done that with a betting company. I've done that with a franchise. I've done that with, I mean, that's how we sold 10.7 million worth of franchises. And then I've done that with a training business, software business. It's just literally take anything that's pretty much a good quality commoditized business, stick a semi-famous person on it and and get them doing weekly and quarterly campaigns and you will very rapidly. You know, a million's only 20 grand a week. And if it's a five grand sale, you know, it's four sales a week. It's, right. not, that, it's not that big a deal. Interesting. Uh, a quick question, Daniel. So just with that strategy, which is, again, a non-sexy strategy, have you then positioned yourself in the way in which you talk about in Key Person of Influence where you are then the face of a business that you purchase. Therefore, you don't have to go out and yeah. attach yeah. somebody else to it. You just attach yourself to it. And that part, that's the way you bring the value. In the, in the early days, I was paying. In my very first business, when I struck, struck it the first time, that 1.3 million, in, I was 22 years old. There was no way I could be a key person of influence in my industry. So I went and found this guy called Kerry, who was 66 years old. He'd just retired. He had a huge story. He'd, you know, he'd run a billion dollar fund. He was, you know, he knew, he just knew the world and the market and economics and all this sort of stuff. And um, I was building a business that ran training alongside of a new piece of software that had been released. And basically I put Kerry on stage every Wednesday night. 70 people would show up to see Kerry speak. 
Um, I'd run an ad saying that he's going to give a talk. People would show up and see him speak. And out of 70 people, we'd get 14 people who would buy the training, which was the training that went alongside a new piece of software. And basically, it was that simple. We repeated that 41 times for the year. <clears throat> Kerry got paid 1500 as a base for giving his talk for two hours. And he also got 5% of every sale we made, no matter how we made it. So he, out of 1.3 million, he got uh, 65,000 for commission on just our revenue target. And then he got 60, 70,000 in speaking fees. So I paid him about 125,000 for him to turn up 41 times and give a two hour talk. So 10 grand a month, pretty much uh, to do, to do a few little talks, you know. So it was basically, I realized, I realized the power of this very rapidly. And it was one of the techniques I learned from John. And then by the time I'd been doing this for 10 years, because I did this strategy for 10 years across a number of different things, I realized that I wanted to be that person. So I could, I because people who get paid a lot of money, like who are key people of influence, they're also real pains in the ass. They're prima donnas. They turn up when they want to turn up. They, they start to believe their own hype. You know, as soon as you start speaking in front of a hundred people a night or a couple of hundred people and people start showing up and following you and all that sort of stuff, it all goes to your head and you become an egomaniac. Like mm. like myself and Rowan, um, <laughs> and, and basically you realise after a while. You, that note, I think it's a very good point to raise it because I, I train a lot of speakers as well. You, you've picked on a very imp- interesting point. That's why I introduced you the way I did because you have balanced that. And I've been mindful of you know, the whole point of being authentic. And I remember a couple of short, brief conversations with you over the years when we've been on and off stage. It's keeping that purity of message and not being swept up by the fact you're on a stage and you've been put on a pedestal. But if you can keep that authenticity, it allows you to keep going back out into the market and people want to come back and and be around you and buy whatever businesses you're offering next. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I, I, you know, 10 years of working with prima donna speakers (laughs) and I realized I just do not want to be that person. My God, you know, like stop believing your own bullshit. You're not Mark Zuckerberg. You're not, you know, you're not, you know, you're not Richard Branson. Just come on, get, turn up and serve, do a good job, get paid well and, and, you know, go, go home and, you know, watch Netflix. (laughs) So basically I got to the point where I thought, you know what, it's far better to be that person than to, than to pay 10 grand a pop to, to have that person. So, so I eventually positioned myself as that person a little bit accidentally and a little bit on purpose, but yeah, so that's the, that's the formula for making the first million. It's really easy if you've just got someone semi-famous around, it's very, you know, a lot of the time people who are a bit semi-famous, they have a hard time figuring out how to turn their fame into money. So it can be a real symbiotic relationship as well, but that, that is a, that's a cracker of a way to do it. And it's, it's. You know, it's one of those things that kind of it works based on human psychology. We're always looking for the tribal chief. We're always looking for the, the person who leads the tribe. We can't help that. Mm. And, you know, the Elon Musk, you know, suddenly builds the company that's bigger than Toyota because Toyota's faceless and, he, and Tesla's not. Uh, you know, Richard Branson cuts through on British Airways because, you know, he's put a face to it. You know, so it happens on a small scale and a big scale all the time. That's the first million, very much, very easy to do. You only need about three or four people plus a famous person and a decent product that's priced around three to five grand. Um, and you can make four or five sales a week, smash out the sales, and and then you're on 20 grand a week and it adds up to over a million a year. Fantastic. So part two for the ones that are thinking, what about more than a million? <laughs> yeah. So uh, so from one to one to 10 million, it gets hard. So a team of less than 12 people can self-organize. You don't need a hierarchy. You don't need a system. You can actually do it in a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group. You don't even need to be in the same location. You don't need to have like team meetings or like it just, it just flows. It's kind of like organizing three or four people to go down and play basketball together. You just, you you can, you know, if you've got three on three game, it's not that hard to organize a three on three game of basketball. But as soon as you actually say, okay, we're going to have a proper team and we're going to have management and we're going to have all of these things, once you get about 12 people, you can't self-organize and you need hierarchy, you need systems, you need a process, you need a way of aligning the team, you need objectives and key results. And all of that costs money and you also, you find that you can't afford it. So between 12 and 40 people is the hardest point in business because you basically, you need people and systems and stuff, but you can't afford it. And I call it, Uh, crossing the desert because you're kind of too big to be small too small to be big and this is the barrier that most companies hit Um, and it's around 10 to 12 people 
you, you, you're going great guns until there. A lot of people discover it at 15 people where they, they're very profitable when they've got eight people, nine people, 10 people, and then they're losing money hand over fist with 15, 16, 17 people and they don't know why. And then they think we better rush back to being eight people because this is, this is horrible. And essentially you've got to commit to what's the business going to look like at 40 people. And you've got to figure out, okay, well, we're going to have a leadership team and a management team. We're going to have operational teams. We're going to structure the business to look like this. We're going to sell in these territories, markets and products. You know, we're going to do one or two of these acquisitions to kind of fast track it. We might raise a little bit of money to to bridge the gap that we need to bridge. And the other thing I've I've noticed certainly with seeing expansion is is the duplication of the original model. So the original model works, and now expanding that, having the people with the right values, the right vision, and duplicating the system that we know worked, but in different yeah, so that that's the difference between growth and scale. So yeah. if you've got one restaurant and you let's say you've got one restaurant, you do one million and you want it to go to one point two million, that's growth. If you've got one restaurant and you want to open up three more that do one million each, that's scaling. So you basically, you, you are, as, as you, you're absolutely right. Typically your strategy for zero to a million is growth. And then your strategy from one to 10 is scale. Yeah. And, and the people factor plays out in a big way now, doesn't it? It's the having three things, the three things that your life becomes about when you hit about 10 million is talent. So bringing talented people into the organization and, and, and you, I can't tell you, what an incredible breath of fresh air it is when you get a new talented person into the company. Like talent, I'm not just talking about team. Team's important, but then there's these people who are like their talent and they literally can come on in and manage and run and attract like a a seven-figure section of the business and suddenly that's off your shoulders and it's like it just frees up energy and it's like, whoa, you know, it's like, wow, my kingdom for six of them. So if you can get, you know, the number one is like, it's all about getting that talented person, that overling, not an underling, that person who's better than you. The second one is proprietary assets. So what you're trying to develop with a 10 million pound business is some form of defensible proprietary asset. You're the only company in the world that has this combination of assets. If people want it, they've got to come to you. You've got something that's different, that's unique, and it's asset model, not not people. It's it's actually proprietary IP software, media, something along those lines. So you're developing a proprietary asset and you're, you're searching, mining, you know, cajoling, cra- crafting, carving, sculpting proprietary assets out of out of thin air. Um, and then the the third one is driving performance. And basically what you want with performance is two things. Number one, if if you do nothing, if you literally let the business just sit there doing nothing, you want a baseline of performance that just keeps ticking over. And normally that's subscription revenue, recurring revenue, you know, those kind of uh, SaaS type revenue uh, businesses. And that means that the business almost, what the business will not just drop dramatically if you do nothing with it. So you could sell it and there'd be like 12 to 18 months of just revenues coming in without having to think terribly hard. Um, so you can project and forecast a minimum baseline. And then the second thing you want is the opposite, which is the growth levers. How do we grow it? How do we how do we run campaigns, promotions? How do we open new territories or markets? And what are the levers we need to push in order to really ramp this thing up and hit, you know, and double it in the next year or two? And essentially, if you've got talent assets and performance levers, then you've got a very exitable business. You can sell that for an absolute fortune if you've got those three things. Right. I'm just... I know Harms is itching to follow up on another question, but what do you have a personal preference at the stage of a business? Does Daniel like startups, the middle, the scale up, or is it a combination of all those things? Because you seem excited about all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I love zero to ten million. Uh, so for me, the first million, running those first campaigns, getting you know, getting people in a room or onto a engaged in a Zoom call or watching videos or into a marketing landing page you know seeing seeing that first traction and then seeing those sales coming in you know that first zero to a million that first original team where everyone's got their sleeves rolled up and we're all just kicking the door off the hinges i love that first million and then that one to ten is so hard and i hate it but i have a love hate thing with it you know that's where it suddenly becomes rewarding where you are you're you're making the business be a bit more of a grown-up company. You're putting in routines, you're putting in rhythms, you're getting those meeting those weekly meetings right, you're getting those quarterly meetings right, you're getting that you know 12-month alignment to one goal. 
you know, with the whole team, you're bringing on team and talent, you're training and recruiting them, you know, you're finding that amazing general manager who can kind of handle most things. So all of that happens between the one and 10. It's hard and I actually find it infuriating, but I kind of have a love hate because that's where, that's where all the payoff happens. Brilliant. Fantastic. And when you say payoff, Daniel, so what you, uh, just for clarity for myself as well, is when we spoke about that, I was going to put it in uh, air marks, boring kind of company, the non-sexy company, which the 50-year-old sells, is it they have that saleable asset now beyond that 10 million point or or when they have these systems built put in? Well, normally between one and 10 million, you've got what's called a family business. Um, you know, it's traditionally in the banking world, they call that like a family business, a business that kind of you know, it's, it might even be a bit bigger, like one to 20 million. And, that, and, and in, in private wealth, they call that, you know, family business. And basically, it's a, it's a fairly stable business, but it's completely privately held, can do what it likes and can, you know, issue dividends if it wants to. And, you know, it can take the business in a new direction pretty quickly if the, if the family patriarch wants to do that. So, you know, that, and that's rewarding because at around the one to 10 million, the business can pay a decent income, it can pay a decent dividend. You know, you can actually hire good people who can run it well and you can pay them a decent income and the business kind of starts to take on a life of its own. As far as actual a proper exit, the minimum amount you need for a proper exit is about a million of profit, which tends to happen around five to six million of revenue. And big companies won't buy a company if it doesn't have a million of profit. In fact, a million of profit is like the absolute minimum. Mostly they want more like 10 million of profit in order to properly buy a company. The, the below a million of profit, you have to sell it to your employees. You have to sell it to a competitor for a four or five year earnout. You, you need to kind of maybe just adopt a more chairperson role and let it pay you an income. And it's not that you've exited the business. You've just exited your time out of the business. So those are the, you know, those are the t- typical options. Fascinating. Okay. So moving on to the final bunch of questions, having built and it's so clear to the listeners now, having built yourself, but also guided others to build businesses, just like the ones we've spoken about over decades now, from your experience. And I asked this again for the people who are in their 20s and 30s, who maybe have been completely shocked by what's been going on in the world around us. And maybe for Rose generation, where they maybe went through that financial crisis and are still in shock from what happened then. So rather than coming out of it and acting in a way that they're going to go create and craft something new, instead what they're doing is they're defaulting to staying what they consider is secure, you know, staying in front of Netflix, getting that basic paycheck. So to give these people some creative inspiration, because my assumption is they're listening to this, they're, they're to this podcast now, and you're downloading all of this amazing information on them that they're excited. But I don't want that block or that fear of what's happening out there in the external world to just shock them into not doing anything mm-hmm. and staying watching Netflix. So to give them some creative inspiration, what big trends, and you have hinted on a couple, will be driving the next decade that these people can get their teeth into? Yeah, great. So th- this decade that's coming is is going to be hugely transformational. So a few things are going to happen. We're going to have 5G rollout, and that means that there'll be lightning fast internet everywhere in a major built up area. And then on top of that, you know, you've got not just lightning fast internet, but the ability for devices to form their own networks in real time. That technology linked with high def cameras, linked with voice to text, linked with AI and machine learning is going to create a fundamental shift in how the world does business and how the world works. It's going to change the way we live and work. And coronavirus has sped everything up. So some big trends that are going to happen. Let me kind of rattle off some big trends. I think what we're going to see is we're going to see the outsourcing of white collar jobs outside of big expensive cities and to much more low cost areas. There's going to be a lot of jobs that we now do in London and New York that are going to be moved to you know, Wichita and Philippines and India and, you know, also Wales and, you know, stuff like that. Places where 
places where you can get an amazing person with a master's degree for 30 grand as opposed to 60 grand. So we're going to, because, you know, everyone thinks, oh, isn't this great? We get to do remote working. That's lovely. I love remote working. We don't have to go into the office every day. Woohoo. But it's only a very short window of time where that's going to be happy and exciting. True. And it's going to be a very big window of time where that's going to be, hey, wait a second. If no one comes into the office anymore, why do we right. need them to be anywhere near London or anywhere near a big city? So, so that's going to happen. The next big trend that's going to happen is a lot of jobs are going to get automated where essentially, or deprofessionalized would be a better word. Deprofessionalized means that a complicated, high-skilled job is a lot less complicated because of the software that's running in the background. For example, it used to be that a, a photographer was a, an extremely difficult job. You had to have very expensive camera equipment but you also had to have a dark room and chemicals and you had to be part artist part chemist and you know just to develop film as a photographer and get those kind of unique and different looks you had to be one hell of a chemist scientist mm. artist and now you just need to kind of have a bit of software and, and kind of like toggle things on and off and okay. let let the software do the work if you want a lens flare you just put a lens flare in um, you know, if you want it to be black and white, you just change it to black and white, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, so you just play around with the images. So that is a, a perfect example of a profession that deprofessionalized. And then, you know, that's going to happen to accountants and auditors, and it's going to happen to lawyers. It's going to happen to educators, all of that sort of stuff. The, the massive leverage of a few key people of influence. I'm, I'm currently doing a meditation course. And it's an amazing meditation course that lasts for a year. And it cost me 90 pounds as an app on my phone. And one guy recorded at one time. And basically that one guy has now solved the problem as well as you could possibly solve it for the rest of the next five years, 10 years. And you just don't need to go and see a meditation trainer or coach. And not even that, the guy who recorded it doesn't need to do it anymore. He put himself out of a job for the next five years. <laughs> you know, like... So, so we have, we have, what's that? Give him more time to meditate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's going to have a lot of meditation time. So the, the, the world, the, the world as a result of this technology, think about how much the world changed as a result of smartphones and 4G and GPS in, in everyone's pocket, you know, and it gave rise to cloud computing and it gave rise to new business models like Uber and Instagram and even the way people meet their partner, you know, using uh, swipe left, swipe right, all of that yeah. sort of stuff is made possible by the mobile phone with the fast internet with the GPS. And then if you basically work on the very basic assumption that 5G is 10 to 100 times more powerful than that and gives rise to 10 to 100 times more powerful applications, then we are about to see the world absolutely shift and change. Um, on top of that, the European aging demographic, the average age of someone in Germany is now 48. The average age of a Britain is 41. That basically means that we're moving into a you know, for every person in retirement, there's not that many people working. It requires, you know, huge commitment to healthcare and all of that sort of stuff. A selling down of assets, a, a moving out of big houses, selling into more small houses and trying to live off the additional equity. But if everyone's doing that all at the same time. So what that means is huge levels of disruption across every industry, across everyone's job and everyone's work. And you have to, you have to, be an entrepreneur. You've got to you've got to have an entrepreneurial mindset because entrepreneurs for for entrepreneurs disruption is problems and problems are opportunities and opportunities money. And for people who love certainty and security, disruption and problems are, are the enemy and uh, it stops them earning money. And it's it's really you've got to get onto the surfing side of the wave or else you're going to be dumped mm. by the wave. And I think you know what COVID has done uh, in in so many ways. It, it, it's not been just like, a, oh, let me take a holiday where most people diffuse for four or five days, then have their holiday period and then maybe reflect a little bit. Should I change my job now? Come back, get settled in, foot back under the table, carry on there for another 10 years. This has been a serious pause. And so many people are asking the question, you know, do I want to do something different? What I've been doing for the last 15 years, I'm getting pissed off. I'm fed up with it. I, I want to make a change. There's all these other people out there trying different businesses, etc. Uh, I think that's the conversation that's happening a lot, which is why these type of conversations are so important. And what you do with Dent and just your whole brand is so important because your position now with decades of experience to take somebody on a springboard who's ready to go and say, this is how you do it. 
because otherwise i'm sure you'd vouch for this people just try and do it on their own they may end up finding that they lose a lot of money feel the pain of it and then slip back into their jobs again oh i tried that but it didn't work so i think there is this as well isn't there yeah and if if you can slip back into your job um because quite uh, exactly currently stands we've just lost the last 18 years of jobs growth so every job that was created in the last 18 years is currently unemployed so we you know it's not there's and i can tell you firsthand every company every company out there is not hiring back everyone who who they furloughed because over the last four months every smart company in the world just figured out how to do what they do with less people and more technology and as you say, there's more technology coming into place that allows people to do the same thing te- technologically instead of with physical manpower. Yeah. So, it, yeah, I think what you're describing in a, in a nutshell is just a, a, an opportunity here for anyone that is ready to pursue something. I mean, this is my own personal view, but pursue something they're passionate about rather than just to chase the money. I mean, that's a personal view I have on business myself, having gone down the road of pursuing the money and then realizing it wasn't the business yeah. I necessarily wanted to do, but I thought I was going to make a few bucks from it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it never got, works. yeah, exactly. And, and as I, it was a question years ago, I was standing on stage with Kiyosaki and a few others in Singapore. And the question was asked of all three of us on stage, three or four of us, you know, what's the biggest mistake you've made? And mine was actually, I've lost money because I just got greedy. I was pursuing businesses that I thought were going to make me money as opposed to ones that I was genuinely passionate about doing that had <laughs> Value. It never it never works. As soon as it's clear and obvious that, that it's a money project versus a passion project, you can be absolutely sure that everyone else has noticed that as well. And right. then they're, they're just going to compete away the profit. And yeah. one of the things for young people like come in does uh, like, yeah, well, people in their 20s, I see so many of them getting sucked into money making things like trading and, and flipping properties and all these kind of things where unless you are extremely experienced and knowledgeable on that particular topic, you are, you're in competition with people who are extremely knowledgeable and, and experienced in the topic. Yeah, and I think any startup needs that level of experience. Whether, and I said this for years as well, as if you're going into property, go learn it. If trading, go learn it. Business, go learn it. Yeah. Which I, I, would leave- say, I would actually say, unfortunately, and I don't know whether this pisses some, some people off, but I'd say forget trading. Like there's no, there is no way you can trade. It is now PhDs with quantum computers (laughs) who you're up against. It's kind of like saying, go learn basketball. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Like the people who are in basketball now are seven foot. Like you're not going to score a single point. Yeah. Mm. And statistically, most people, I mean, it's like 90% of people that start trading within a few months or a few, you know, within a year have lost most of their funds as well. Yeah. Uh, very different world out there. So, okay. So I'm conscious of your time as well, as we wrap this up, brilliant summary there. What's ahead for the next two decades. So I'm going to wrap up before I hand over to Harminder. I'm going to ask you a couple of final questions. Number one is if somebody listening to this wants to stay in touch with you and, you know, discover what you're teaching and, and get access to what you do and how you help people, et cetera, what was the best place they can go? One of the easiest things, actually, you guys could help me out with this. I released an, a revised edition of my book, Oversubscribed, and okay. I have a storage shed with hundreds of old oversubscribed and old Entrepreneur Revolution books that are not the second edition versions. Anyone who actually wants to just simply connect with my work for free, drop my office an email and we'll send you out. We're trying to clean out the storage shed of these books. So we'd be absolutely thrilled if you give us your mailing address and we'll just send you some of these books fantastic what an offer yeah in, in, info at dent.global just email my team and they'll they'll send you the books okay and and harminder you can make sure that that's put at the back here of the podcast as well correct absolutely absolutely uh, last thing then what would be whenever we wrap up on the growth tribes podcast we always whether it's just us doing it or we bring in a guest and again you, you're literally one of the first few guests we've brought in what would be a few actions that dan Priestley, with all the years of experience that you've had what could be some things they could do now what would be a next couple of steps to keep that momentum off the back of this number one commit to stop watching the news just don't watch the news at all yeah. um, <laughs> just tune out from that and spend spend half an hour a day journaling rather than watching news. So sit quiet during the time that you would normally go and put on the news and unwind for the day, 
you know, if you like a glass of wine, go find a comfy spot, grab a glass of wine, sit with a journal and, and start writing down some ideas, some thoughts, and just sit there until something comes up and just basically say, what, you know, what are the types of things that would change my life for the better? Who should I hang out with? Who are my networks? What, what makes up my mountain of value? And just spend the same amount of time that you would dedicate to looking to statistically irrelevant events. Sit and think, you know, right. sit, quiet, sit quietly, have a, have a glass of wine and journal. That would, right. be, that would be one, one idea I would recommend. Let's add to that. If you're going to do it, folks, try and, I mean, I'm, I, I sort of float between when I'm out and about, I have my iPad and I'll, I'll use my pen there, but there's, there's nothing more special than doing it in an actual journal, a physical journal with ink mm. and paper it has a different relationship it's like last year i bought a typewriter an old style typewriter to start typing things because oh lovely the feel of it and and it was uh, it was a uh, one of the, the hollywood actors says i've he's taken to capturing some of his thoughts on paper but with a typewriter because one press of the, the button it's a unique experience it can never be the same whereas with a computer it's repeat so yeah. what a great tip on journaling but another- uh, i i'm, I'm the, i buy these mont blanc journals these oh, yeah. beautiful clear non-line no lines free form and i have a couple of really nice pens so it's a beautiful experience and i love to just sit with a big uh journal and just journal love it another tip yeah so getting a mentor is an important one you know one way or another get around i've got this saying called environment dictates performance and it's actually the core philosophy of why accelerators work so environment dictates performance basically says humans are environmental creatures creatures of environment we we behave the way our environment thinks that we should behave so we tune into environment and we we're in, if you ever watch these Darren Brown documentaries where he gets people to do pretty outrageous things, he just makes it normal for that environment for you to do the outrageous things. Or Borat, you know, Borat turns up and creates an environment where everyone suddenly, you know, does something pretty horrible, but he creates an environment where that's the normal thing to to do. And then suddenly, you know, they realize what they're doing and, and it all comes crashing down. So you can use that same philosophy for positive things. So environment dictates performance means that in your environment, most of your friends are the types of people who are, are achieving things and doing things and making things happen. You know, you've got a mentor in your environment. You've got people in your environment who can fund a project if you, if you want to. You've got accountability and transparency, you've got access to strategies and best practices. So really work on building your environment or get into an environment that already exists. You know, you can apply to be in Dent. Um, the thing with Dent accelerators, we have about 2,000 people fill in a uh, form for every 50 people we take on. So we are massively oversubscribed. You know, I would recommend getting on a Dent accelerator if you can, but about 1,950 miss out for every 50 who get in. So at, by all means, take the key person of influence accelerator, uh, key person of influence scorecard, do the scorecard. That'll be a great first step. You'll get some immediate insights. And then if you want to apply to be on one of the accelerators, but the reality of that is, is that it's, it's an exclusive experience. Daniel, we can put that or palms. Can we put the link to that at the back of the podcast on the notes? Yes. And I'll remind listeners where that is when I sign off. Well, look, I'm going to personally, as a friend and someone who's known you a long time, just first of all say congratulations on the kids getting married, <laughs> that thank amazing you. journey on a personal level. And just thank you for your sincerity, your honesty, just the down to earth approach that you have to everything you do and, and the way you've shared today. Huge amounts of value. You've packed a lot in to the time we've had with you. And thank you again, Dan, for joining us. It's been an absolute thank pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Amazing. So there we have it. Environment dictates performance. And I think that's a fantastic final takeaway. So if you want to, you know that the environment dictates performance by the very fact that you're listening to the Growth Tribes podcast. And if you want a fresh new business orientated environment to start accelerating in, I will put up everything Daniel has shared with us into the show notes, which you can find at growthtribes.com forward slash podcast. So all of the things he's mentioned, they will be there. And the email that you can email Daniel's office to get that free book oversubscribed. And like I mentioned, that's one of the first business books I ever read. And the principle and the concept has stuck in my head ever since. So incredible book. Okay, so for myself, thank you, Daniel. This has been a business masterclass and one that we shall point people to whenever we talk about the 
topic of business on our podcast going forward. So massive thank you to yourself. Myself, Ro and Daniel signing out. This is us signing out from the Growth Tribes podcast. Remember, all the show notes will be at growthtribe.com forward slash podcast. Hello, it's Dr. Rowe here. Harms and I would both like to personally thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of Growth Tribes. And if you've gained just one insight, something positive that you're able to use on a personal level, on a professional level to help your life, maybe even other people's lives, then we'd love it if you could take action on one of the following things. You can either simply subscribe so you don't miss out on any other great insights coming up in the future. You can share this podcast with close friends so they can also get the benefits of the tips and tools that we're sharing. Or it would be amazing if you could give us a review and let others know just how great this episode was. And finally, if you do have a question, don't forget to submit it on growthtribes.com forward slash podcast. Thank you again for listening. This is Dr. Rowan Harm signing out and we'll see you again on the next podcast.